William Shakespeare once observed that there is a history in each of our lives. Each of our stories, whether of great national significance or on a smaller personal scale, is important. But while the grand actions of world leaders get the ink in the history books, it is often the small stories of everyday lives and places that impact us most directly. Just as individuals have their own unique stories to tell, so does a place. A town is much like its inhabitants, who walk its streets, work in its shops, go to its schools, and live in its homes, in that it too has a life and history that is uniquely its own. A town is a living thing in itself that is born, grows, changes, and adapts. The face of a town is reflected in its streets and buildings, but its heart and soul is its people. Some towns die and fade away. Others flourish and remain vibrant, embracing the people who live there with a profound sense of place. Such towns have a shared experience among the residents, providing a strong bond that unites them for the common good, while still encouraging individual freedom of expression and thought. Groveport, Ohio is such a town a place which gains its strength from its rural roots and pioneer past. A place whose lifeblood once was the calm waters of the Ohio and Erie Canal. A place unafraid throughout its lifetime to embrace new ideas, philosophies, and technology, while all the while retaining its history, small town flavor, and sense of identity. This is Groveport's story. The land was old, but the idea of Ohio was new. Nature shaped and enriched the soil of what would, in 1810, become Madison Township in southeastern Franklin County. Located in the glacial till plains, these lands were thought by many to be some of the most fertile in Ohio. The area is well watered with four major creeks, Big Walnut, Black Lick, Alum, and Little Walnut which replenish the fertility of the bottomlands annually when the spring rains gorge their channels, spilling the water over their banks. The waterways encouraged farming, as well as agricultural-related enterprises. But in the days prior to statehood, the Ohio frontier of the 1790s was the scene of bloody conflict between a confederation of Native Americans and the United States military. The area of what would become Groveport was once the hunting grounds for the Shawnee, the Wyandotte, and the Mingo nations. The Native Americans scored a significant victory in the Ohio Territory over General Arthur St. Clair's troops in 1791. But an intensified and more organized effort by General Mad Anthony Wayne eventually subdued the Native American Confederation at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, resulting in the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. The Greenville Treaty made settlement in central Ohio a promising option for settlers, and many headed for southeastern Franklin County by walking or by wagon over rough, narrow trails westward that wound through the woodlands. What they found when they reached central Ohio was a land covered with dense forest growth that teemed with wildlife. Once here, they built log homes for themselves and began to clear the land to plant corn, beans, wheat, and garden vegetables. One of the first families to settle in what would become Groveport was the family of Adam and Mary Catherine Rary in 1812. Adam built a tavern at a convenient stopping point for travelers along the dusty, stump-filled Columbus-Lancaster Road, which would eventually become Groveport's main street. The tavern did a brisk business, serving foot-weary travelers and also serving as a gathering place for local farmers. With the promise of good land and opportunity, Madison Township grew rapidly and by 1820 boasted a population of 1,097, second only to Montgomery Township, which included the burgeoning state capital, Columbus. But by the early 1820s, growth slowed. Settlers began to realize there was no cheap, efficient form of transportation to move surplus farm goods to market. The rough, often impassable, muddy roads made it almost impossible to get farm produce to eastern markets, which lay beyond the formidable Appalachian Mountains. The seaport of New Orleans was a perilous distant journey down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, 
where Ohio farmers were stalked by disease and river pirates. The high prices for farm produce during the War of 1812 had bottomed out once the war ended and military purchases stopped. Once the army left Ohio, no significant local market existed as the Columbus market had not fully developed. Then there was the problem of disease. Yellow fever claimed many in the Groveport area, especially in 1823. News of epidemics kept prospective settlers away. People had little power to fend off indiscriminate disease, but Ohioans could fix their transportation problems, and Groveport's strategic spot and fertile fields would be a boon for the community when the state tapped into its water resources to reach out to the lands beyond its borders. In 1825, a grand project was begun to link Ohio to the world. The state would build two extensive canal systems, the Miami and Erie Canal linking Toledo to Cincinnati and the Ohio and Erie Canal connecting Cleveland to the Ohio River at Portsmouth. This system would provide an accessible outlet for Ohio farmers and merchants to East Coast markets. Not only could Ohioans now export goods more cheaply and efficiently, but they could also import goods such as hardware, farm implements, textiles, processed foods, and other finished goods making frontier life easier and more attractive. Canal towns became centers of commerce. Construction of the Ohio and Erie Canal began on July 4, 1825 at the Licking Summit. From there, canal builders moved southwest to the Scioto River Valley through Baltimore, Carroll, Lockville, Winchester, and finally to Groveport, a spot crossing the Columbus-Lancaster Road then known as Rarysport. Area settlers and Irish immigrants provided the labor for the construction of the canal around Rarysport. They were paid 31 cents a day and two jiggers of whiskey for a workday defined as sunup to sundown. All digging was done by hand, the principal tools being a shovel, a scoop, and a wheelbarrow. It was back-breaking work and it took its toll on laborers. Throughout the length of the canal, laborers died from diseases such as malaria and cholera. Accidents and murders also took their measure of lives. Alcohol abuse was common. But there was money to be made with the canal. Adam Rary bid $200 to build the covered bridge over the canal on Main Street. W.H. Richardson's $2,937 bid for Section 52 of the canal through Rary's port included channel excavation plus construction of Lock 22 just east of town. The sandstone lock, which still stands today, just east of Black Lake Park and north of Groveport Park, is 90 feet long by 15 feet wide, a snug fit for canal boats. The lock's function was to lift and lower boats to meet the changing terrain. The canal opened in Rary's Port on September 25, 1831. Three freight boats floated into town that day, the Red Rover, the Cincinnati, and the Lady Jane. A crowd gathered to watch the boats come through. George Champ wrote, when the crowds heard the cheering and the music of the band in the direction of Winchester, all eyes and feet expectantly turned in that direction. The boats, pulled by mule teams walking on a towpath beside the canal, glided through the water, barely making a ripple. A new age had dawned, and the citizens of Rary's Port knew it meant the promise of prosperity. When the canal opened, about 100 people lived in Rary's Port. By 1840, the population had more than doubled to 250 and nearly doubled again to 480 in 1850. Businesses geared to the new canal economy sprung up. Just below Lock 22, Jonathan Watson constructed a dry dock and boat yard in what in the 20th century became Blacklick Park. The yard, later known as Chandler's Dry Dock, was the first notable such operation below Baltimore, Ohio. As shown in this drawing by canal historian David Meyer, a canal boat coming in for repair would float into the dry dock and workers standing in three feet of water positioned it over a trestle. The dock was then drained to a small stream. The boat yard thrived for many years, building new boats, fixing others, and providing employment to a number of Groveport men as boat carpenters. Ice harvesting on the canal in winter also became a booming business. Workers cut large blocks of ice from the canal with hand saws to be used for refrigeration purposes. And the canal also stimulated the saloon trade. Merchants began to prosper 
as Rarysport's centralized location in Madison Township, along the canal and the Columbus-Lancaster Road, made it an ideal shipping and receiving point. William Rary, eldest son of Adam Rary, owned a warehouse bursting with 40,000 bushels of corn grain awaiting shipment. Newcomer Jacob Wirt, who arrived in 1832, established a grain warehouse of his own, along with a dry goods store and a slaughterhouse that in the winter of 1834 to 1835 butchered 35,000 hogs for shipment. Business was good. Money and land meant power, and soon it would spark a confrontation between these two prominent men. The success of Rary and Wirt, coupled with the growth of the town, prompted competition between the two powerful businessmen. Wirt's success enabled him to buy more land and become a rival of the Rary family, which had extensive land holdings of its own in the area. By 1837, Wirt established a post office on the southwest corner of East Street, now College Street. Here, he set himself up as postmaster of a community he named Wirt's Grove, that lay side by side with Rary's Port. Wirt's community lie west of the township section line on College Street, while Rary's Port lie to the east of the line. The original township hall, which still stands on West Main Street at Center Street, was located in Wirt's Grove, and Jacobstown was listed as the election site for Madison Township. Wirt soon requested that all mail to the area be delivered to his post office and not to Rary's Port. These assertions did not sit well with Rary, who was determined that Rary's Port be the principal settlement in the area. While Wirt's Grove had the township hall and post office, Rary's Port was listed as the Ohio and Erie Canal port in the area on freight and passenger packet boat timetables. The conflict soon escalated with Wirt scratching the words Rary's Port from any mail received at his post office, while Rary encouraged everyone to use Rary's Port as their mailing address. Both men felt they had solid claims to establishing the settlement and its name, and both filed official town plats with the county, Rary in 1844 and Wirt in 1845. William Rary was the eldest son of Adam Rary, who had established one of the first homesteads in the village. He had historical and economic roots in the land that he and his family had developed and had seen it change from forest to neat farms, businesses, and homes. Jacob Ward had established the post office and had the business acumen to embrace the potential of the canal and its boost to the local economy. His businesses provided jobs and eased the process of getting farmers' produce to markets. One settlement, split in two by name only, proved to be unacceptable to citizens. The dispute over mailing addresses alone was too confusing for both residents and outsiders alike. When it became clear that Rary and Work could not resolve their differences, the townspeople took it upon themselves to settle the dispute by democratic action. On a winter night in 1847, citizens gathered at William James Cooper shop on Walnut Street, somewhere near the spot along the canal to discuss the town's future. Neither Wirt nor Rary were invited. The citizens agreed to form one town, with Dr. Abel Clark suggesting the name Groveport, using the suffixes of Wirt's Grove and Rary's Port. Elections were held in April 1847, with Abraham Shoemaker, who owned a brick home on Cherry Street in Wirt's Grove, elected as mayor. Neither Wirt nor Rary were nominated to serve in the new village government. Wirt eventually moved to Obetz, where he died in 1850. Rary continued as a community leader until his death in 1877. All the while, Groveport and its canal continued to thrive. In addition to being an economic boon to the town, the canal waters also became a source of recreation to the citizens who fished from its banks on lazy summer days and skated on its frozen surface in the winter. The canal waters were also put to spiritual use by churches for baptisms. But the days of floating quietly down the canal by boat were numbered, as a roaring machine belching smoke and fire would soon replace the wooden boats. It was canal boats that floated area soldiers off to fight in the Mexican War of the late 1840s. But it was the railroad line in Columbus that carried Groveport soldiers off to fight in the Civil War of 1861 to 1865. By the time of the Civil War, Ohio claimed 2,974 miles of railroad track, ranking it first in the country. The speedier locomotives were not tied to a water source like canals and could reach the entire state. It was the beginning of the end for the canal. By the end of the Civil War, plans were being made to build a rail route east from Columbus to Asbury to Canal Winchester, then southeast to Lancaster and Nelsonville. 
Groveport's leaders realized that if the railroad passed the village to the north at Asbury, it would have a devastating impact on the local economy. Without the railroad, Groveport would decline with its aging canal. Spearheaded by Groveport businessman Michael Corbett, Groveport citizens quickly raised the $25,000 stock subscription needed to secure consideration for bringing the new rail route through Groveport. Groveport then sweetened the deal by paying an additional $7,500 to secure the right-of-way from Big Walnut Creek to Canal Winchester. Corbett then solidified the offer by donating his own land for the railroad right-of-way through northern Groveport. The deal worked, and construction began following the Civil War. The first train of the Hocking Valley Railroad passed through Groveport on July 16, 1868. The community had banded together to bring the train line to town and ensure the town's viability. The railroad became the preferred mode of shipping and travel. In 1875, five million pounds of freight, mostly livestock and grain, left Groveport by rail, and 5,088 passengers passed through the Groveport Depot. The railroad brought a taste of the industrial age into Groveport. But the town remained primarily a farming community until the early 1970s. The only major industrial concern in Groveport in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was the brick and tile yard on the south edge of town along the canal. The remaining enterprises were still geared to the agricultural economy, such as the blacksmith, grain dealers, the creamery, the chicory, and the farm implement store. In essence, most everyone living in town was a farmer, as residents maintained large gardens, stabled their own horses, and raised chickens and hogs. Dr. John Saylor was even known to store wheat in the unfinished front room of his fine large Main Street home in the 1870s. The garden at the Elmont Hotel on Main Street in the 20th century boasted 14 acres of potatoes, and another 40 acres with tomatoes, cabbage, beets, peas, beans, melons, apples, cherries, and strawberries. The yards in Groveport were plotted to be large, to make room for the large household gardens, as well as stables and outbuildings for animals. Farm and town life were truly intertwined. In the years following the Civil War, Groveport was still a rough-hewn town. One way a frontier village could show the world it was civilized was through the construction of public buildings and theaters. Groveport and Madison Township achieved this during the year of the nation's centennial in 1876 with the construction of Groveport Town Hall. Its construction was a community affair, with Groveport, Madison Township, the Masons, and the Odd Fellows all chipping in on the $10,745 cost of construction. The high Victorian Italiente Hall at the corner of Main and Front Streets features tall windows, handsome stone and wood moldings, and ornate ceilings. Originally, the third floor meeting rooms were used by the Masons and Odd Fellows, and the first floor once housed a hardware and a grocery and was still used for retail space until the 1960s. The second floor holds the auditorium. The auditorium has been used for plays, concerts, speeches, temperance debates, dances, and even for high school basketball games. Throughout its history, Town Hall has been a bustling hub of activity, and in the 21st century, functions as a community center, art gallery, museum, meeting place, and concert hall. Town life also has a spiritual side. On the Ohio frontier, it was the Methodists who made the biggest strides in bringing faith to the hinterlands, originally meeting in homes in Madison Township as early as 1804. Hopewell Methodist Church, just south of Groveport, and Asbury Methodist Church to the north were the first congregations to organize in the area. Services were led by circuit-riding preachers who were often self-taught and rose from the ranks of the pioneer culture. Congregations accepted these preachers because they shared common roots and values. The Methodists built the first church in Groveport in 1836, a small brick structure which stood at the corner of Main and College Streets until 1851 when a much larger brick structure was erected. That church served the community until 1908, when it was torn down brick by brick to make way for a new $25,000 church. The new church rose from the same site, 
and is noted for its fan-shaped arched stained glass windows, fine stonework, and cranberry red bricks. It still serves the Methodist congregation well into the 21st century. Other churches formed. The Presbyterians organized in 1853 and built a brick church on College Street, and it is the oldest church in continuous use in Groveport. The Catholics established St. Mary's Church at Front and Blacklick Streets, whose site later became the Groveport Municipal Building. In 1933, the St. Mary's Parish established the St. Vincent Mission at the end of Naomi Court. In the late 20th century, the building became the corporate headquarters for United McGill. The Baptists built a frame church at College and Cherry Streets in 1843, but it was later raised in the late 19th century. The Lutherans built a formidable brick church at Center and Main Streets in 1918 and used it until the early 1970s when a new church was completed on Groveport Road. While the town's spiritual side was well tended to, by 1848 it was clear its youth needed a more organized educational system. Longtime Groveport resident and school teacher Nora Carruthers remembers those early school days. The children attended the one-room grade school nearby called Mudsock. We walked the one-half mile to and from school each day in the rain, snow, or sunshine. The first public school was built on the northwest corner of Walnut and Elm Streets in 1848, and it served the community until 1884, when this larger school was built on the west side of College Street, north of Blacklick Street, at a cost of $10,634. The school housed all 12 grades and was expanded in 1912 with two classrooms and a laboratory. 411 students earned diplomas at this school during its history. Flora and I started to high school along with our cousin Marie Dowler in the fall of 1917. We drove a horse and buggy and rented a stable to put our horse, Jack, in for Mr. Shride. By 1921, the school had become too small, and the citizens in the Groveport-Madison School District voted to maintain three schools, Edwards Station, Bryce, and Groveport. The decision was in harmony with the state of Ohio's desire in the post-World War I era to consolidate and centralize school districts. The three-story red brick Groveport School, built in 1923 on Main Street at a cost of $225,000, housed all 12 grades until the mid-1950s. The structure features a separate gymnasium and auditorium, making it unique in its era when most schools combine these two facilities into one room. Ten acres of playground and athletic fields ring the structure, where generations of children have romped and played. With the population continuing to grow, the school district continued to grow and needed more space, leading to the construction of a new high school beside Groveport School, which served the district as a high school until 1971, when yet another high school opened on South Hamilton Road. The Groveport-Madison School District is woven within the historical fabric of Groveport. The public school is the common shared experience in a community, a place of common memory. It is this historical connection that led to the school district's adoption of one of the most unique school mascots in Ohio, the fierce stallion Cruiser. The story of Cruiser and the man who became his friend is rooted in the 19th century history of Groveport. John S. Rary, born in 1827 in his father Adam's tavern on Groveport's Main Street, exhibited a talent for horsemanship at a young age. People from throughout the area brought their unruly horses to him to be trained. As he grew into adulthood, Rary refined his humane Rary method of training horses and built a strong national reputation as a horse trainer. It was in England in 1858, where Rary had traveled to work with the British military and its horses, that he impressed the soldiers and Queen Victoria with his unusual methods of kindness, firmness, and patience in training horses. This led to a challenge by the Earl of Dorchester to Rary to attempt to train the Earl's vicious stallion, Cruiser. Born in 1852, Cruiser was a dark bay whose coat shone black and who stood 16 hands high. The stallion was noted for his speed, 
but his vicious and foul temper made it impossible to race him. Cruiser was known to go into fits of rage. He would tear at the ground, kick, scream, and tear his stall to pieces. Rary accepted the Earl's challenge in the spring of 1858. He traveled to the Earl's estate, Merle Green, to meet Cruiser. Despite repeated warnings of the horse's foul temper, Rary calmly walked into Cruiser's stall and did his work. Much to everyone's surprise, Rary emerged from Cruiser's stall riding the stallion in just three hours. Rary soon gained ownership of Cruiser, and the pair toured the world, giving exhibitions and garnering worldwide fame and wealth. To honor his spirit, Cruiser serves as the mascot for Groveport Madison Schools because of his and Rary's example that combining power, strength, intelligence, discipline, kindness, and patience brings success. For generations, Groveport Madison athletes have reflected these qualities. Over the past 100 years, Groveport Madison has competed in the Franklin County League until 1957, the Mid-Eight League until 1974, and the Ohio Capital Conference in a variety of sports, and has won its share of championships. Baseball, rooted in America's agrarian past, was the first sport to be organized by the primarily agricultural community of Groveport. The first teams played on a field near the former high school on College Street, and then on the fields and playgrounds of Groveport School beginning in the 1920s, and finally moved to a modern-day landscaped field on South Hamilton Road in the late 20th century. Baseball and softball were embraced by men and women alike, and pickup games on the playgrounds and pastures were common. The boys and girls basketball squads produced some dominating teams in the pre-World War II era and beyond. The girls' 1919 team went undefeated. Nora Carruthers remembers. We always had pretty good teams. Our girls' basketball team were state champions in 1919. The team won 22 consecutive games. Boys basketball teams of the era also garnered their share of the headlines, such as the 1938 team that went deep into the state tournament and featured famed Groveport athlete Max Sims. Boys basketball also won a mid-eight title in 1964, as well as a string of OCC championships in the 1970s and 1980s. Football squads began playing in the World War I era and have represented themselves well over the decades, winning county, mid-eight, and OCC titles. The 1929 team shut out nearly every team it faced. The 1963 team that featured quarterback Jim McKee went undefeated in capturing the school's first mid-eight football crown, while the 1971 and 1973 teams took the mid-eight titles in the league's waning years. The 1986 and 1988 teams advanced to the state playoffs. Groveport Madison has fielded a track and field team since the early 20th century. In the early years, the athletes performed on makeshift sites, but by the 1930s, a new cinder track and field event pits were in place at Groveport School for high jump, shot put, javelin, pole vault, and broad jump. In 2004, a new track facility was in place at Cruiser Stadium on South Hamilton Road where a new generation of champions have emerged. Other sports have also been prominent. The wrestling team of the 1960s dominated the mid-eight league, winning five championships. With the coming of Title IX in the 1970s, girl sports have expanded and opened a whole new competitive playing field for more athletes. While athletics have a strong popularity in the community, so do the arts. In the schools, theatrical productions of all kinds and music have played a strong role in students' development through the years. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was common for communities to have a town band, and Groveport was no exception. The band performed in area parades and in weekly concerts at the old bandstand, which stood near Main and Front Streets, until disbanding after World War I, as people turned more and more to the radio for entertainment. A prime scene of the social life in Groveport was at the Elmont Hotel, which stood on the site of Adam Rary's former tavern, and was once John S. Rary's mansion, Cedar Lawn. The Elmont was a Groveport showplace through the first half of the 20th century. 
The magnificent 25-room structure featured black marble mantelpieces and a ballroom large enough to hold dances, weddings, receptions, and other galas. Fraternities and sororities from Ohio State University and Capital University held dances there, arriving in Groveport in special traction line charters. Situated on the hotel grounds were several cottages that visitors from Columbus rented in the hot Ohio summers to escape the heat of the city. Some of these cottages were eventually moved to Canal Street in the 1950s. The hotel thrived until the 1950s when it began to deteriorate and became more and more costly for its owner to maintain. With the post-World War II population baby boom, Groveport Madison schools were looking for a site for a newer, bigger high school and bought the Elmont property. Erecting in the 1950s what in 2004 became Groveport Madison Junior High School at 751 Main Street. The passing of the Elmont and its genteel 19th century ways was just one of the markers that denoted Groveport's changing face in the 20th century. Once again, changes in the village, which in the past were stimulated by the canal and the railroad, would be triggered by new transportation sources. Groveport had grown up along transportation routes. In 1815, Adam Rary's Tavern on Columbus Lancaster Road, now Main Street, had established Groveport's roots. In 1831, the Ohio and Erie Canal connected Groveport to the world. The railroad enhanced this link to lands beyond Ohio's borders when the rails were laid through town in 1868. By 1901, the canal's vitality had faded. And while the railroad continued to thrive, a new form of transportation arrived that electrified the town with possibility. The interurban or traction line was an electric railroad. A third rail carried 600 volts of electric current that propelled cars along standard rails. The interurban was designed to move passengers and freight between regional towns and Groveport's location between Columbus and Lancaster made it a logical place to extend the electric rails. On July 19, 1904, the Scioto Valley Traction Line ran its first car from Columbus to Canal Winchester, passing through Groveport on Blacklick Street. The interurban car's 62 mile per hour speed amazed passengers and onlookers alike. The four mile trip from Groveport to Canal Winchester took only five minutes, an unheard of speed at that time. This speed immediately shrank the time it took to travel between Groveport and Columbus, forever changing the town's relation to the capital city. During the 19th century, Groveport was somewhat isolated from Columbus by the 12 miles of rough roads it took to travel to the city. Now these 12 miles could be easily and cheaply traveled in a matter of minutes. People no longer had to live near their workplaces since the interurban could shuttle them to jobs farther away. People could work in the city while enjoying small town life. The new electric train also expanded shopping and business horizons for the village by making Columbus markets more accessible. It was the beginning of a new age for Groveport as a suburb of Columbus. The electric railway played a major role in the growth of the village as the population nearly doubled from 519 to 946 during the heyday of the interurban from 1904 to 1930. By 1930, the emergence of cars and buses, as well as improved roads, sounded the death knell for the interurban. But after passenger service waned, the Scioto Valley Traction Line still hauled freight on its Groveport tracks until the mid-1950s, including coal delivery to the Pickaway power plant. The well-preserved interurban tracks are still embedded in Blacklick Street as a reminder of a lost era. Groveport's relative isolation and agricultural economy had made the village a stable, comfortable community. The upswing in population and the advent of improved transportation systems fueled small business growth in the village in the 20th century. The Claycraft Brickyard on the south edge of town along the canal, which was originally founded in the 19th century by William Mason, was the village's major industrial concern in the 19th and early 20th centuries, making high-quality brick and tile, much of which was used in construction in Groveport and Columbus. The brickyard operated until the late 1920s when it closed. Debate remains on why the plant ceased to operate. Some say the supply of good clay in the area had been depleted. 
while others speculate talk of plant workers unionizing in the fledgling years of America's national labor movement led to a management decision to close the plant. Save for the closing of the Claycraft brick plant in the 1920s, business thrived in Groveport during the era. Then came the difficult times with the stock market crash in 1929 and the Great Depression of the 1930s that followed the national economic debacle. The Great Depression hit Ohio hard. Unemployment in the state rose from 13.3% in 1930 to 37.3% in 1932. Nationally, in 1931, thousands of banks closed, along with 125 in Ohio. The Groveport Bank, established in 1904, was one of those Ohio banks, wiping out the savings of its customers and making money scarce in the village. Though money was hard to come by, the people and small businesses of the town adapted through mutual trust and an ability to pull together. Business owners negotiated payment plans for customers or worked out barter agreements. Others expanded their businesses, such as pharmacist Kenneth Doc Ackerman, who, while compounding medicines for his human customers, also learned how to make up veterinary medicines for farmers' livestock and people's pets. But the steadiest jobs during this era belonged to the men at the Big Walnut Power Station. The power station paid 40 cents an hour for a five-hour shift over a five-day work week. The ice plant also did steady business, making several tons of much sought after ice a day for much needed commercial and home food preservation and refrigeration uses. The Great Depression was a bleak time, but the townspeople's resiliency pulled them through. Many Groveport men and women heard the drums and marched off to fight in the nation's wars. In the Groveport Cemetery lie the remains of those who have fought America's battles, extending all the way back to the Revolutionary War. The first significant number of Groveport soldiers to go to war joined Madison Township units in the United States Union Army when the Civil War erupted in 1861. Throughout each war, those serving received the support of those at home. At the end of World War I, when word of the signing of the armistice on November 11, 1918, reached Groveport in the early hours of November 12th, someone began ringing the schoolhouse bell on College Street in jubilation at 4 a.m. People came out to see what the fuss was about, and word soon spread that the war to end all wars had ended. Soon, all the church bells were ringing, and the crowd informally gathered downtown, happily talking among themselves, with occasional shouts of joy punctuating the air. Just as at the end of World War I, the community exhibited its natural urge to informally gather in a time of national unity, when in September 2001, townspeople somberly assembled in the old downtown, following the terrorist attacks on Washington, D.C., New York, and in the air above Pennsylvania on September 11th. Sadly, World War I would not truly be the war to end all wars, as the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, soon confirmed. World War II is the conflict that has left the most lasting impact on Groveport, touching both those at home and those overseas. Domestic rationing of rubber, gasoline, shoes, scarce food items, and other goods was common to support the war effort. The war also saw the construction in 1942 of Lockbourne Air Force Base, southwest of Groveport, on what were once farm fields. The ever-present military planes flying over the village became a common sight and sound for residents during the war years, the Cold War, and today. The base, now known as Rickenbacker Airport, still has military flights, but has now become the source of an economic commercial boon for the village with its shipping economy. World War II took a bloody toll on the world and also scarred Groveport as some of the town's own were killed and wounded on the battlefields and seas of the conflict. Groveport sought to honor these men and women at the end of the hostilities. On Memorial Day 1946, the Groveport Lions Club dedicated a stone memorial in the courtyard of Groveport School to those who had served in World War II. The memorial is a large Ohio boulder emblazoned with a simple plaque that reads, erected in honor of those men and women of this community who served in the armed forces during the Second World War and the following emergency and occupation. Nestled in the soft green grass, the memorial is a reminder of their sacrifice.
In 1997, the people of Groveport created Veterans Park on Main Street to further honor all of those from the community who have served in the nation's military. Each Veterans Day, a ceremony is held here in their honor. Memorial Day in Groveport is well remembered in the community as each year dating from 1921, the Robert Dutro American Legion Post 486 and the Groveport Madison High School Marching Band lead a parade of children carrying flowers to be placed on the graves of veterans in Groveport Cemetery. It is the nature of small towns never to forget their own. Growth is the operative word in Groveport in the post-World War II years. Groveport's population rose from 1,042 in 1940 to 1,165 in 1950 to 2,043 in 1960 to its current level of around 4,500 in 2004. The 1950s saw the annexation of the 29-acre, 66-home Kessler Edition on the town's then western edge in 1952. Other additions followed on Clark Court and Holton Street, as well as the 200-home Westport subdivision west of Tallman Street in the 1960s. The town was and is growing as new 21st century subdivisions such as Newport on the town's southern border and Grove Point and other new neighborhoods on the northern border are in full bloom. The resulting growth has increased business, traffic, and other problems. To help control the situation, Groveport abolished its part-time marshal position in 1966 and hired police chief Al Whipple, who built the police department into a fully equipped, well-manned staff. Whipple served until 1980 and is credited with instilling the department's continuing philosophy of community policing, which involves the positive interaction with the citizenry by the police to the town's officers. Whipple was replaced as chief in 1981 by Groveport's own Roger Adams, who served until 2001. Adams expanded the department, and under his watch, not a single officer was severely injured or killed. In addition to police protection, the Madison Township Fire Department maintained a fire station on College Street in Groveport from 1947 to 1985, when a new station was built on South Hamilton Road. By the 1970s, Groveport's days as a farm town were fading. The town gradually shifted from its agricultural focus to a more service-based and general shipping economy. In the 60 years since World War II ended, much of the land around Groveport has changed from rolling farm fields of grain to housing developments and industrial parks. Gas stations sprouted up throughout town to serve the omnipresent automobile. Where there were once warehouses along the canal bursting with grain and slaughtered hogs for shipment, there are now large big box warehouses ringing Rickenbacker Airport, generating tax revenue for the village and shipping products of all kinds by air throughout the world. Sources of recreation changed too. Where once people might take a dip in Little Walnut Creek, in the 1960s the place to be was the large concrete swimming pool where kids and adults splashed away the summer days. Built in 1960 on Hendron Road and funded by individual bondholders, the pool was a hotbed for activity for kids for swimming, volleyball, sunbathing, rock concerts and parties. The pool served the town until the new $3.5 million aquatic center opened in Groveport Park in 2003. The town's revenue from its industrial parks enabled it to acquire parkland throughout the village and also construct the new recreation center in Groveport Park, which opened in 2004. With the arrival of modern facilities and expansive growth, some in the community felt Groveport's connection to its past was thinning. The Elmont Hotel was gone. The train station had long been raised. The farms were disappearing. The high school was no longer situated in the downtown. Canal Lock 22 was crumbling and covered with brambles and brush. To preserve Groveport's sense of identity and solidify its link to the past, the Groveport Heritage and Preservation Society was formed in 1972. The group has been active in many activities designed to preserve and educate people about Groveport's history. Its most famous effort is Apple Butter Day, held at the Log House in Heritage Park each October. The festival harkens back to the harvest gatherings of the town's pioneer roots. 
People gather in the autumn air around smoky fires cooking apple butter, eating homemade food, observing old trades, and reconnecting with friends. Apple Butter Day is the one time of year when the entire community gathers to renew old ties and reaffirm among themselves in the hectic 21st century that they are a community. Why has Groveport survived when other small towns along the Ohio and Erie Canal have stagnated or faded away? Groveport had the ability to adapt to modern forms of transportation and technology when other towns were not able. The village's proximity to Columbus enables it to take advantage of the benefits of urban life, such as jobs, access to technology, and cultural events, while also retaining the benefits of the autonomy of small town life, including lower crime rates, a slower pace, familiarity of neighborhoods, and small town events and activities. Groveport makes an effort to recognize and preserve its past through its architecture, historical markers, Groveport Heritage Museum, and in its urban planning. Groveport citizens of the past would find a mixture of the familiar and the new if they were to walk Groveport streets in the 21st century. There are many old homes along familiar streets where they could easily still find their way to the parlor. They would find the canal bed dry, but still noticeable on the landscape. Though some storefronts are gone, many are still there, only updated, as well as many new ones to pique their interest. Groveport has changed when it needed to, and preserved where it could. The town that struggled to find its identity when it united Wurtz Grove and Rarysport in 1847 still fights to maintain its independence and sense of place and community in the face of the ever-expanding Columbus city limits and demands of the modern world. It is the village's resilient and changing nature and the people who live there giving it heart and intelligence that has ensured its survival.